everybody. Uh, welcome to the first night of the Blastathon. I think that was Michael Parker who was spraying me there. And I was about to leap back because I thought it might be nutmeg spray. Well, I know many of the people in this room, so I know that you uh, that you all need a little Tanactin. And in fact, Blaster wrote a long, long story about people snorting Tanactin years ago. I can't remember what it was. It might be even E.L. the Haunted Nice Icebox, the movie that we're possibly going to show later on today if our, if our minds don't give out. So I'm going to start out. I want to just I want to just tell a couple quick blaster stories before we get started. Yeah. Um, and then we'll get into Catherine Bennett and probably Kevin Takis and um, Bethany Dinsick and then take a break and then a bunch of other stuff, um, including Roddy Watt. Um, so, uh, and hopefully I won't get too choked up. Um, I started corresponding with Blaster when I was about 14. Uh, it was a, a lucky accident. My mentor, Tentatively Convenience, had given me the pornographer Richard Kern's magazine, Dumb Fucker. And I opened it up, and there was uh, Confessions of an American Ling Master. At the time, I happened to be a page in the Senate Page program, uh, working for Senator Sarbanes. And my job working for Senator Sarbanes was to uh, open the senator's mail which in the days before anthrax was pretty, seemed like a potentially pretty boring job. And uh, so I would go into work and I would open the mail and stuff and every once in a while there'd be like a crazy letter in the mail and um, to the senator, like I remember one that I opened up, we talked all about how uh, Nixon and Haldeman were hiding in the person who had written the letter's toilet trying to steal his feces because of the um, bionic serum in the trace elements of blood and his feces and could the senator do something about this or whatever. So things like that excited me a little bit and, and kind of broke through my work a day, you know, experience of being this young page in the program. And because um, I was groomed for the White House, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and uh, so anyway, so, so I, I happened to mention to one of the people I was working with uh, there, my supervisor, that I thought these were funny, and he said, oh, well, if you think that's funny, take a look at this, and he took me in the back room, and there was a huge file that he pulled out, and it was like 20 years of all of those letters that had been sent to, to the senator, and I'm, but nobody's video recording, you know, this was, this is, of course, a violation of a lot. It's of course a violation of, of a lot of different laws and confidences. So, so I photocopied all of these letters from all of the cra crazy people who had ever written the senator, and I sent them in a package literally about this big to um, 207 Fremont Drive in San Antonio to Blaster Al Ackerman, Dr. Ackerman as I called him for most of the time I knew him. And um, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship because it was like you know Christmas in July for him when he got this package and he wrote me back that that he you know his sort of faith in humanity had been restored and you know that um, that you know that he could really relate to some of the the individuals in here and um, I still have all those letters and uh, so anyway Blaster and I started corresponding and um, in the worst year of my life which was uh, 1986, um, I would say it was the letters of Al Ackerman that kept me alive. I probably would have been a suicidal wreck had I not gotten them. But they were so consistently funny and so brilliant and deranged and great and everything that um, they, they really, really lifted my spirits. Fast forwarding to the early 90s, um, right around the same time that I met uh, Jack Bright, um, who's playing tonight, um, Blaster, uh, his long-standing relationship with his wife, uh, um, Patty, excuse me, ended, and um, we, anybody who was a correspondent of his had seen it coming, but he left San Antonio, and he basically, I, I think it was probably a year and a half or something like that, that he spent on the road basically couch surfing, and this is a big deal for Blaster because um, he, you know, he had been, I think, very much a homebody. Like, even though he inspired a lot of insane behavior, he himself 
was sort of the master of his universe in his kitchen doing his mail art and, and kind of projecting his mind outwards that way. But now he's on the road, and so Rupert and I were corresponding with him, and he was writing for Shattered Wig a lot, and I was, he was giving me lots of love, love life advice in weekly um, letters. It had a huge uh, effect on me that way. And um, he used to, Blaster used to, after he came to Baltimore, he used to hang out in bars, and if he sensed that I was attracted to a woman, he would sidle up to her when I wasn't looking and say, you see John over there? He's really into starfish. <laughs> He liked, he liked to sort of intervene in that way. But, um, but anyway, so, so Blaster, uh, Blaster was kind of not, not finding a home. He was staying with Crowbar Nestle, a famous drug dealer in Jersey City, and the Asp, uh, a small-time criminal that runs the Suds and Duds laundromats in, on the West Coast, and making his like, very, very small amount of money to buy food from by selling cat paintings. <coughs> for about a year and a half, really at loose ends. And so Black, uh, Rupert and I did what I think is probably one of the best things that we ever did in our whole lives. I don't know if Rupert would agree, but we, we'd send him like 75 bucks or 100 bucks or something like that and brought him to Baltimore and um, without any sort of plan of what was gonna happen. And he moved in with me for about six or eight months. And then he moved out from living with me and moved in with Rupert. Um, and he lived with me and Rupert various times um, over the years after that and with other people. And he also started working in, uh, in normals, obviously. So anyway, um, up until uh, two years ago when he moved back to Texas, he had been living with me for two years before that, um, convalescing after a, a, um, a stroke and some other things. But he was obviously a huge part of our lives. And um, anyway, I have, I have, during the course of the night, I might tell another story or two and read a text or two of his. Um, but uh, I, the one story I want to tell you that, um, that uh, leaps to mind before we go into the first, the first bit here is that um, when Blaster first arrived in Baltimore, he lived in a tiny apartment with me down by the train station with a guy named Randy George McWilliams, who was a good friend of mine that I lived with and sort of a uh, kind of a... Uh, a uh, I know how to put it, sort of a, a sexual uh, uh, genius of Baltimore, sexual Adonis of Baltimore, um, incredibly well-equipped um, guy, and uh, really sweet, too. And um, anyway, um, Blaster lived with us, and I don't think I even told Randy that Blaster was coming, you know, like, and he was there for a long, long time. And Blaster, when he arrived, he, because he'd been living on the road and because he had gone through this divorce, which involved and it's hard to know how much of this is true, but he was very intense about it at the time, that he basically said his marriage had been destroyed by Native American medicine then. And um, including, he claimed, one that could turn into a, a dog or a wolf. And when he arrived in Baltimore, he seemed really crazy, like in a way that I don't think many of you who knew him would have, have seen him. Like I would be talking to him and his eyes would roll back up into his eyes in a really creepy, creepy way. And years later, I asked him about it, and he said it was just because when he was on the road, he was doing enormous amounts of drugs all the time. And that when he arrived in Baltimore, he was like so Texasified by drugs. You know, not, not hard drugs, but just like tons of alcohol and pot and stuff like that. That he, um, he was in this really, really weird state. And I was in a weird state too, because uh, right around the time he arrived, I had been uh, I had been uh, experimenting with taking big doses of neurotransmitters for the foolish purpose of trying to make my memory better. And I was taking this substance called choline that they give to people who have Alzheimer's because I was starting a business and I kept forgetting things and I wanted to be able to remember things. didn't have that effect on me, but it did make me really, really um, his histrionic all the time. So Blaster moved into my apartment with me at a time when I was like bursting into tears and laughing. And I was writing this magazine at the time that he, that he was a little bit involved with called Toad and Rice Weekly. It was, it was all about a little sort of beanbag called the Toad and Rice that, that was in the magazine presented as being simultaneously a little beanbag but also a world leader and also sort of like a huge apocalypse that was going to destroy humanity. And um, I was corresponding with a woman down named uh, Rachel uh, my friend Lee Warren had put me in touch with who had started the magazine and I was sort of 
great trading off issues with her. And so one day Blaster came home, and this was kind of like an iconic moment in our friendship, and I think when we really bonded. He came home into our cramped little hot, sweaty apartment, and he found me pouring over envelopes on the desk, and I had this big envelope that I was sending to this woman that I, was my collaborator, and I was laughing and crying incredibly hard over this envelope, and I had attached a whole bunch of dust bunnies to it with, huge dust bunnies to it with, um, <laughs> with crazy glue, but I had also gotten the dust bunnies on my fingers. So the dust bunnies were kind of like these plumes coming out of my fingers. And um, I think at that moment, that was when Blaster decided that we were going to be friends in real life and not just through the mail. Um, so anyway, um, so I'll, I'm going to tell another story or two. But in any case, um, uh, I want to start with some readings. Um, Catherine Bennett, are you, are you set? Great. And by the way, it's great to have Catherine Bennett, John M. Bennett, Jack Wright, uh, Ben Bennett all here tonight. Yeah. Give me more Bawa. And Bawa happens to be a name that his grandson William used for his scatological number two. <laughs> Carry the lint into a movie theater, 
And when the feature comes on, cover your head with glue and glue the lint to your head. Then tie on a blindfold and stumble through the theater making weird sounds, doing your best to find A and B. When the, uh, when the ushers come, give the name C. Merrill Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few more little uh, Lexus Chorus that he packed, and at the, I'll just let you read those on your own. But um, at the very end is a collaboration that we just did through the night, <coughs> sending something back and forth. Ackerman CMB Bawa Jam. I actually took her out once or twice. But it was the way she bawled all the way to Trader Joe's that made me lose my appetite. <laughs> and before our last quarter of Bawa, we'd already decided that Bawa is why I fled. I felt guilty that I put the old Bawa bag out with any strict reason. But in the end, she was just happy to be out of the house. <laughs> sort of drawing attention to himself by letting everyone know who listened to him that he didn't do it. It wasn't his fault that it was those damn kids in the alley again that shoved a bottle of Old Spice up his ass. somewhere that every year would find this guy and shove a bottle of Old Spice up his ass again. But uh, it became his idea that maybe he wasn't lying. That maybe he shouldn't doubt this guy in the emergency room with this affliction should give him some credulity. There's a possibility that he was telling the truth that there were, in fact, where he lived every year or so. He was minding his own business, taking out the trash. Who knows what? He set upon by a bunch of kids in an alley to 
do that horrible thing. So, in my mind, not in blasters, but in my mind, I sort of ascribe the Old Spice gang to be sort of like with the little rascals, like our, our gang. Like, Shane Spanky, what are you going to do? I'm going to go home to get me some shut-eye. What are you going to do? I'm going to go home and shove a bottle of Old Spice up that guy's ass again. Come on, Spock! And then Blaster would say, those boys were bad boys. <laughs> Sometimes he would say to me, you boys are bad boys. Or Sometimes, and this was <clears throat> referring to a saucy anecdote from my own life that I won't tell right now, he would say, he would, he would remind me of it by saying, you boys are the best damn boys in Baltimore. <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the things, that, one of the stories I wanted to tell about Blaster, and anybody who feels free to chime in on this one, because I think this is a potentially participatory kind of thing, but in many ways, Blaster was an obsessive person, um, one of the most obsessive people I've ever met, and um, part of his obsessiveness, it manifested in many, many different ways, often many wonderful ways, but one of the ways that it manifested was his love of what I think Kevin particularly would call memes, but like essentially kind of like little distilled perfect droplets of meaning that he could kind of resurrect and use over and over and over again. And usually the more sort of off kilter, the better. But there are phrases that Blaster said to me thousands of times <laughs> over the course of the last you know 20 years or whatever. Like, Every time I saw him, he might say a certain phrase, and so I'm curious if this is if other people can elicit some of these that I might have forgotten. But like one good example was we had this very off kilter young heroin addict that was stealing books in the store, and Blaster was always big on naming uh, customers in the store, well, categorizing, taxonomically categorizing them and naming them, um, and. This guy he called the cat in the hat, which was a really, really good name for him. And apparently, one day the cat in the hat had been hiding in the back room. Like, he was often sort of hiding in different rooms trying to, you know, wait till whoever was running the counter couldn't see him so he could steal a book. But he was kind of sneaking around in the other room, and Blaster was running the counter. And all of a sudden, he just heard the guy say in the other room, like after hours of silence, say, Oh boy, I really dig the zombies. <laughs> so for years after that, Blaster would say to me, like when I would see him, he'd be like, John, oh boy, I really dig the zombies. You know, um, that was that was a that was a really, really, really good one. Um, then there were other ones that are probably so time worn as to be, you know, boring to, to many of you, but things like how did your performance go, John? Did they rush the stage and try to hurt your back? It was really this idea of people trying to hurt each other's backs in various ways. Or then there was a whole then there was a whole side of things of, did you steal my watch? That was a big one for a long time. Not to mention the same sort of obsessive behavior in the mail. Hundreds of envelopes sent to to me, just to me, and I can only imagine how many more to other people that were written on the back scrawled the words, this will explain, <laughs> or, and in fact, I believe that tentatively Convenience has made a film for this Blasterthon called This Will Explain that, it, that maybe animates or does something with all this material that he got over a long period of time from Blaster that said that too. The other one that went along with This Will Explain was a lot of envelopes would say, for immediate distribute, <laughs> which, I always thought, which I always thought was really, was really a good one. Are you drunk? Yeah, oh yeah, are you drunk? How could I forget, are you drunk? So can, can people remind me of some other ones? Does anybody? Are you my daddy? What's that, are you my daddy? That's a good one. Well that what? dog seems to be moving his bowels real good. Yeah. That was a good one, that was a real good one. When a certain uh, superb uh, improvising musician would come through town, 
Blaster would always say, many times he would always say, Jack, are you still harboring a parrot in your shorts? That was one of his. I'm going to pass around this picture of Blaster and uh, Rupert. This is, this is Rupert when he was a young um, hipster on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, is what he looks like here. I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I, wanna, I just want to read a couple quick texts here. <clears throat> this first one is called, Why the Burnt Group? And you'll notice that it has the word small shaft in the middle there. I found this on my desk one day at work. <laughs> Since 1993, the Burnt Group has built creatively designed, technically sophisticated websites for myriad different types of clients, both local and national, from the healthcare, business, and arts communities in the medical field. Oddly enough, we are the agency of record for development for Meet Bud Me Medical Center. <laughs> and we have done substantial work for IUD USA, Jet Twat, and Chili's Party House. <laughs> Chili's Party House came up a lot over the years. In fact, I, I pretty much can't stop talking about Chili's Party House. I don't think it actually exists, but... <clears throat> we recently came in second out of 20 firms in the competition for the white prior to the sidewalk, gleaming thin and flappy like a hamster's severed loud hole. A contract which was awarded to a firm that I would describe as no better than dry cleaners for queers and cripples. <laughs> Our recent work has more than proved our ability to drift like meat, your nostrils splayed against where the state of emergency helping to deliver highly functional sites in time for Christmas shopping or a rush of bees. Gassy, eh? Our recent clients for brand building websites in the technology area have each tumbled your black pipe. <coughs> So as to enjoy that chocolatey goodness, our copywriter has much trouble spelling. We once saved the day by grinning loser that loose. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Grinning looser than a pink cluster of included pork. Parentheses: the world's largest delivered distributor of sludge fun. We have been partnered for many years with the shaft, and I do mean giving it to the customer, and I do mean. Small shaft. <laughs> Our clothes can be seen throughout the week at Long Gum, Inc. Our technical capabilities are tight as micro comic voice saying from the lunge, your shoes and butt. In other words, solutions with up come to us, pardon my French, thinks me vacuum cleaner hose. Most of all, I want to initiate sex with your parents. <laughs> I'm so excited about the prospect of this, that needles curving through my back, garble shirt or sandwich fuzzy in the fridge, fuzzy because it's been sitting there longer than it takes to complete the smallest project. Years, in fact. There were days and there were days. Not only am I excited about initiating sex with your parents, but I'm also excited about foaming. Ongoing, hopping, shopping on a rush basis without the slightest idea of what it is I'm shopping for. That's why I carry in my pocket this chili rag. It's a rag of sun. First your shoes, your, you, first your, your shoes, you butt. It's hard to read some of these sentences because you don't parse very well. Sun, first your shoes, you butt. When you think about Prez Prado, does anybody remember Prez Prado? Yeah. yeah. Perez Prado, he's my second cousin who came to work for us last week and has webbed feet that grows, as do all of us here at the Burn Group, I might add. Uh, wow. And uh, I'm just going to read you a little bit. Um, if, it, if you've never corresponded with Blaster, um, you haven't lived. Um, and here is a letter indicative of his style as a correspondent written to my dear friend Reinhard U. Sebol, the founder of Antineuism, um, who is a kind of a, um, an alcoholic who lives in Paris. Dear M. Sebol, or Crulebarbe, if you prefer. Nevertheless, I was 
at V much interested in your patterned stipend uh, stipulation for the double negative, which you say must be used as in Russian, which equals one CSAT or wiggle. Today, the thing to remember is what takes place between something and itself. Nevertheless, we were that some, that something, and we did not know it. Whereas we now know, but we are it no longer. Plus, the ineffable brilliance of Benny Pilcher, his great brain indicating that, as you say, warmth and eucharage, his slowness, which is that of all of psychology, unlike the great work of William James, who said it was true if you can crawl in the back seat and make out with it. M. Savol, my very dear old friend, and by the way, I know for a fact that this was the first letter that he ever wrote to Savol, and it was out of the blue. <laughs> um, and it's pretty funny imagining Savol getting this letter, because he's also totally insane. Well, my dear old friend, you have come to the right place not only in the fuzzy intellectual exercise, or as you say over there in France, exercise, a thing that has also mm, been found in how we must carry a basket of eggs more carefully, but not because they are more important than a basket of pimentos. And many people ask, quote, May I have a pimento? <laughs> the answer is, quote, no, Tony, you may not have a pony. It comes. It's what I always say, quote, this ignorance, ignorant multitude works, or it is merely cussedness of the flammarion of flaming foods. This goddamn thing you keep talking about, is it what we fear? Communism. Next paragraph. Oh, dash, luckily man's greatest fragility and the consequent delicate pessiary necessary in handling a human being's leg eggs, lest one inadvertently bruise one or two. God damn it, what is this? Exclamation point. But we must advance calmly, and Dave Zack, who you mentioned, another totally crazy person, by the way, Dave's, Dave, Dave Zach's stories for a long time. All I'll say about Dave Zach is two things. One, he could make people physically sick by playing a cello upside down, and this is true. And two, <laughs> late in his life, he took about 30 people to some remote South Sea island on a sort of a made-up cruise thing that he put together, and he left them all there and stranded them there. And there are websites on the internet where they have a support group for people who went through this. And he... Zach used to live with Ackerman in the Portland Academy, and, and he ate, Ackerman's main comment about him was that he ate all of his food, but anyway. Oh, luckily, I'm oh, sorry, where was I? I don't want to read any of this more than once. <laughs> but we must advance, we must advance calmly, and Dave Zach, who you mentioned, who was not mentioned, um, and who I'm unsure I will remember who he is in just a matter of seconds, or as the duck fanciers always insist on calling it, a millardiplex. <laughs> we bust or express superciliousness largely through misplaced shyness and misplacement. Why did you steal my watch? And you keep mentioning this neoistic inquiry into the early part of your letter. Well, I think that it is not the abyss where venture the most credulous and the most incontinent or inconstant of our senses, it is what we despise, this, and then there's like 20% signs in a row, and then row of cherries, this bow, this bowl or perceptible world, perhaps for overwhelming with, with all of its perfections. Now the only neoism that we ever need concern ourselves with is salminioism. All right, however, I mean the wonderfully adjusted Daba debasement. I said that myself not two weeks ago. Well, right, so far, uh, perhaps, as you have noticed, I've typed everything here, everything so far with my eyes closed, which, by the way, it does kind of look a bit like that, um, while I was resting, as it were. <laughs> How's it look? Hmm. And say, this doesn't look too bad for a man with his eyes closed. And why the F don't you do it? <laughs> and all the others, too, who say, quote, Oh my God, I just woke up? 
Question mark. Get the hell away from me, Sullivan. Pretend she's not here. Quick, do 50 sit-ups. One, two, three, four. And then at the note, there's the following, at the bottom, there's the following note written in handwriting. Dear Mr. Savol, sorry about that. It's just that Benny Pilcher, one of our patients, uh, it's, just, it's just Benny Pilcher, one of our patients. Dr. Ackerman is out of town on a seminar this week. And Benny, as usual, got into his office and used his stamps, letterhead, etc. to try to answer his personal mail, etc. Unfortunately, fortunately, I came in and caught him before he got too far. Well, I'll send it to you in case it may be of use to you for your research. Researches, whatever those may be. Stay cool, Nurse Sullivan, orderly supervisor. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we're going to next have some music from Bethany uh, Dinsick. Sick Din.
picks up women in bars with balloon animals, carries small single shot revolvers with him at all time that um, that are like Civil War revolvers. He's always getting arrested for having these revolvers on planes and things, and um, and and is sort of just a despicable, dangerous person. And Reinhard Sibol is, is who I lived with for a couple weeks in Paris when I was 18. You know, he's a he's like a very very um, off kilter, deranged character as well. And he once berated me in Paris because I wouldn't urinate on the side of a building with him. And you're just high strung, is what I would describe. Him. And so, and this was after hours of photographing him do these performances in the Paris subway where he would fall on the ground and pretend to have epilepsy while wearing a, a white gloves, a white jumpsuit, and a pillowcase over his head with eyeballs all over it, teddy bear eyeballs all over it, connected by uh, licorice. And he would, this was, this is what he called an anti neoist activation. And we did about, I don't know, seven of them in one day. And it was fun, but um, I, was, I was pretty bummed out when he got so upset about me, about me not, for not urinating. But anyway, so, so, so Blaster sends the asp to Sibol in Paris. The asp shows up at Reinhardt's apartment, rings the doorbell, no answer, rings all the doorbells because he's a you know, maniac or whatever. And the landlord comes out and in broken English explains to him, no, I've evicted him, I evicted him last month, but I think he's living across the street, I think he's living across the street illegally in the, one of the stalls of the public toilet. And so the ASP goes across the street to the public toilet and discovers that, and this is all true, that Reinhard Sibol is actually living in the public toilet in a very, very demoralized state, needless to say. And the ASP being a millionaire, and, but also being a little bit of a Luciferian character, makes a pact with Sibol, which is that if Sibol will assist him ach achieve one of his great life dreams, he will pay for him the security deposit to get moved into an apartment rent. And so Sibol, who had formerly been making his living as a Berlitz teacher, but had been fired, a uh, translator, he, uh, he helps the ASP achieve his, his great goal, which took a couple days to realize, which was that Sibol wanted to get a Parisian taxi cab and wearing his a aviator hat and his goggles, wanted to drive around the L'Arc de Triomphe as fast as he possibly could in somebody's cab. So he had to get Sibol, who was like on the verge of a nervous breakdown, to talk the French cab driver into allowing him to do this for $1,000. And finally, they were able to find a cab driver. And it was a great relief to Reinhardt. And he got an apartment. He got out of living in a bathroom. So that's that would have never happened if not for a, a letter from Al Ackerman <laughs> to Gerald the Asp Simonson. And that's not an unusual story in the world of Blaster. That's like one of a uh, of, uh, hundred. Um, oh, can we go directly into Roddy Watt at this point, or do we need? That could be a few minutes. Okay, so we're going to take a little break, and then uh, we'll be back with Roddy Watt, which is Jack Wright, uh, John Bennett, and Ben Bennett. <laughs> Traveling artiste. Yes, it's, it's actually six bucks. If you're not performing, it's six dollars. Oh, okay, six dollars. Yeah, we can we can <laughs> we'll grab it from you at the next break. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. All so the way out. The next break. All the way out. The way out. <laughs> <laughs> so the next break. The intermission. There's kind of like a. There's kind of, you know. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, we don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, Blaster. Blaster had a strange relationship with the with the red room for a couple reasons. He was very supportive of improvised music, even though I don't think he actually liked it at all. Um, and he would always love to come and, and, and run the desk during the, the shows, because right when the show would end, the set would end, he would turn up a record he had queued up, and it was usually the first ELO record. Like, sometimes it would be Wet Willie, 
We're really into Wet Willie Southern Boogie Rock to get that going. So that the people who had just had, you know, like 45 minutes to an hour and a half of really kind of dissociative improvised music would suddenly get this huge blast of Southern Boogie Rock. Um, he was good at that. He would also write me letters under various pseudonyms trying to um, book acts at the Red Rooms in the early days. Like one, I got many, many letters from somebody called, was like, Kate Hudson and her all-naked girl roller skate review. And it was like 45 people that they were trying to fit into the Red Room to perform, and I just kept getting these letters from them. So, anyway. Roddy what? Now you break. 
and our dust sleeps against the wall. Pleasure breeze, oh old cage, hog face starting off. Take crowd with you. Breeze age, hog face, trying to do it to that barking plastic cup clattering in the wind. It's sleepless, but visible combs spinning and jumping far out on the water. My eyes at the sticky sill. Note your great belches, sleeveless, but still fear, like pants down time. Roast bean, my double dim meal, why the frog rises in the mountain when you open your mouth. These hacks were done in 2012 and the very beginning of 2013.
kept his hair neat. He always kept his lawn mowed. Several people looked at the loose skin, molds trimming, sticks of shad, or shattered rocks, terrible, and black rice sprawls outside. Time to say, flame hole, your whole farm came. Come on, my place with the frozen eyes. and mice very dirty with the seeds of black perfectos shudder so violently over the cigar case it moans along like actually a reporter off his rocker thinks tank ball buried in your face ugly husk you left a was that the mortal form your trimmings assumed? Yes? Then let's talk seriously about honey flavors inside your pants. Let's grow hoarse and anxious and form a doll sham. A doll sham has its limitations, but then fission lush with algae isn't one of them. One so hardly recessive is the gene that makes your towel drool. Several people glanced at your precious towel. Several people must be eliminated. A sack all misty means the saurian's body flow into the shape of a huge, gray, tall mouse. And breath crawl inside your face, done you the seeping wistful. Lols, crust, see thing, but when you got dolls and a towel that drools, the only solution is rum and lots of Fire itching, let them quiet times, and 
morning I coughed up something that so exactly matched the word gelatinate. I had to laugh, couldn't stop, see through to the passage, the hirsute brethren, the ones in black wet wool with boxing glove noses. They make your neck itch fiercely so the bull never dies as they say out in Spokane. And while you're at it, gelatinate, appetizing, rat-killing dishes, gelatinate, all wisdom in watching television, gelatinate, daily private victory, gelatinate, think, win, win, gelatinate, you boss me, gelatinate, anything called stewardship, gelatinate, there are no little things. Then, T.S. Eliot expresses so beautifully my own personal discovery and conviction. The shaken big man is coming for all our asses. There is crutches. There is crutches.
of the new formalism. The gas aeration to which you pray is bright as a thumb caught on a cargo. The ill-respected hand pressure of your tights shows a rim pooch that prompts remorse. These are the calumps dim in November evening like wallets cut with air glue. Furnace mass, bled feet, lake clung. You tapped ah sun where dog max stuck. Ankle stud toward the gentle fluke sucking your prong for mud. As mole sped small claims as its reward, and boost me no clock gates, which started with the business cusp it is rather sordid. Thus works no blink the blink of a day. Hey, the guts of eat your nose, blood red, hug the bun gnome that grabbed the cheese spray that moved in liver purse, that fed hot shed or rustled, gagging on lupus, strap it nod, cod leg, husband, pimp lust. Chewed a bat, club soggy, yet shot full of clothes. Wow, hey, look, it crawls, not pat on tree shape, but froggy the gremlin, motherly horse. Pops and hums. Look up, look down, look at my thumb. Gee, you're dumb. I believe there is something coming out of that ceiling light. It is not exactly more light, and it sure isn't a flagpole. But what else could it be? Have I suddenly started seeing a light bulb on a wire heaped with bloody foam and sodden rags? Or is it more like something left over from all those years when I was injecting battery acid into my forehead. Eyes. <laughs> Something like an improper number of toes came around the side of the house and pointed to some flies nailed to the door. This is how the story of the Mad Carpenter begins. By the time it ends, what we have learned is us afraid to turn around. Afraid we will favor our keys over our underwear, perhaps. Or maybe afraid to be shown words in the house that it was in fact a collection of folk. 
only ice inside your pencil nuts and pending drool, so I slush a cloud. But suppose it begins to grow a key from the urgency of something else. Pendulation of a stingy towel? Got screws tiny? Which do you think my nasal thought when it was shown how your stone foot came around the side of the house? And then there was nothing for it but to order ornato and sick. Let stink brush your suit a while. Nothing for necks and filthy sleeves when nothing's washed but washed a lot. Like whorehead, let's say.
students. All of these publications uh, that I read from here and more by Blaster are available for sale in my little bag right here. <laughs> himself an eccentric character, but he also was often horrified by eccentric characters even more than he was horrified by normal people, which believe me, he was plenty horrified by almost all the time. Um, his life history was, was unusual in that uh, he was born into an extraordinarily wealthy family in Texas, the Hogg family of Texas, H-O-G-G, -G. I don't know if any of us heard of I'm a Hogg. <laughs> But, but that was a that was a famous political uh, slogan, um, for real, um, from the when from the twenties from the thirties. The Hogg family was a big oil family in Texas, and because they were sort of a rich, you know, white napkin crowd kind of family, um, when it was it turned out that Blaster's father, who he was quite fond of, was severely mentally ill, um, had paranoid schizophrenia, essentially, I guess, would be the diagnosis. The family decided not to have him treated or put away, but they were very wealthy and they just had, um, they just tried to kind of contain it so that it wouldn't actually um, create social problems for them. And so Blaster grew up from a very early age in a household where the patriarch of the household was kind of under house arrest and was behaving very, very strangely and often embarrassing all the other people in the household who were people that Blaster didn't like, you know, like, like the sort of authority figures in the household were constantly being thrown on the defensive by strange things that the father would do in the course of his madness. And so Blaster grew up around that, and I think, it, you know, I mean, I don't need to be like a cheap, cheapo psychoanalyst here, but you didn't have to, to talk about it with him for very long to realize it like deeply, deeply informed his sensibility. And then on top of that, um, when the Vietnam War came around, he, he tried to dodge the draft by joining the Catholic seminary. Did not go very well. There was a very bad car accident uh, when, um, under the influence of alcohol, he got kicked out of the seminary. Um, he and a bunch of other people were hurt in a car accident where he was, I think, driving. And he got kicked out of the seminary. And um, so in order to continue to try to dodge the draft, he went into the Houston it was like the university in Houston's library. He found a way that he could that he could actually um, kind of like Sabol living in the toilet. He could live in the library at night, and people wouldn't know that he was in the library. That he was lurking in the library at night, and they didn't have janitors or whatever. Or there were he was able to somehow elude them. And so there was like a I think like a three or four month period where Blaster lived in this library and just did nothing but read. And you know he would he would like leave during the day, but at night he would just be up reading in the library. And he told me that he read like thousands of books during that time. And eventually he was caught, and he was forced to to to, to go into the army or else face prison. And they originally sent him to Alaska, which he loved because it was like crazy wild west and hard partying kind of place. But that only lasted, I think, for like I don't know, like half a tour of duty or whatever. And then they sent him to Vietnam, and when he went to Vietnam, um, he had the worst job that you could possibly have in Vietnam, which is Arabac. Arabac is where they helicopter you in right up to the front where the battle is, and without any weapons, having any guns or any weapons, you, you, uh, you basically jump out of the helicopter and try to pick up all the pieces of people that have just been shot to shit, and you put them back in the helicopter. And 
I mean, to say the least, Blaster was a, a brilliant, sensitive person by any by any uh, you know um, any measure. So this did enormous damage to him. And when he came back to the U.S., he um, uh, you know I think was in a very altered state from that. But the way part of the way he coped with it was by getting a job in the emergency room. It was probably partially pragmatic because that was the skill he had, but and he had, had a, and he had a kid pretty quickly, I think, with uh, Patty. But also it was that he, um, you know, I think that he was like coming out of Vietnam and, and sort of having trouble adjusting to to regular life, and so he was in the uh, the hospital and he worked in the burn unit and you know all kinds of intense stuff. And then at a certain point after he discovered mail art, he just basically stopped working. And the only work that he would really do is that like once every summer or two he would do the census and he would go around and he would do you know census taking from people and many of you have probably heard his stories about the census taking but he would he would throw in these oddball questions when he was doing the census like if, it, if people were tuning out he would throw in a question like have you ever eaten a robin into the you know or have you ever lived in a special dwelling like a treehouse you know like, <laughs> but anyway it's a little bit of blaster biography that I thought might be of interest to folks. Um, I would now like to introduce Bonnie Jones. Blaster and I would be working for several hours. We 
we'd sort of like finish up, you know, put the books back together, or put the papers back together. We had, I had a lot of boxes and a lot of binders, and I had a ton of stuff that I was sort of cataloging. I had to write down whatever item was and who it belonged to, just so I could, you know, not have to tear my own heart out at the end of it. Um, so when we would, after we were finished, after we were finished um, our work, we would like kick back, and, you know, he'd bring his six pack of gambling, and um, I'm, you know, top shelf Jones, as I'm sometimes known. I would break down some nice spirits for myself, uh, you know, some Baileys, uh, I like the Irish coffee, that's blasphemy. Brother Theodore is drinking. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, some, uh, some screwdrivers, you know, tonight I brought some tequila. Um, and we would just kick back and, and we say, you know, what kind of normals, you know, chit chat. We were, at this point we had spent so much time together, we had sort of just gotten into this easy storytelling, chit chatting kind of place. So I was young and I was the piano about tequila. Um, and, um, some, uh, as time passed for these three months, a sort of a ritual would, um, would sort of like take, take seat in our, in our sort of post-archiving hangout. Um, and typically, it would involve Blaster telling me like, yeah, and then I saw, you know, the cat in the hat today. <laughs> Was it the cat in the hat? Yeah. Yeah. Cat in the hat or the, or the, the, the crowd? What were they called? Cloggers. The cloggers. Cloggers and the, the duck fillers. Because that was sort of like a sub a sub project of, of mine that I wanted to kind of create like an encyclopedia of, of all of the of all of the normals the normals monikers. Um, so he would he would tell me something about his day and and I would you know listen various stories cautionary warnings um, you know pearls of wisdom. So I would listen to these stories and drink my tequila with Bailey's or screwdrivers or, um, or vodka tonics. And, and, um, and, and usually, more often than not, um, once I get into like a real rousing kind of like early spirits buzz, uh, I, I tend to fall into a certain kind of category of stories that kind of immediately spring to mind. Um, Perhaps it's the, the dull throbbing of hard liquor in your mouth and the flush of heat um, that sort of takes over you after that first uh, big bowl. <clears throat> but typically, I always start talking about my teeth. Uh, you see, I've had a pretty, a pretty sad and sordid dental history. I mean bad, since I was a kid. <coughs> I was blessed with, or cursed, blessed, I mean blessed, you know, if I, if I married a dentist, maybe I'd be blessed, just like, they would make lots of money. But I was cursed, <laughs> I was cursed with horrible teeth, horrible teeth since I was a young girl. Cavities, constant, endless cavities, usually multiple ones in the same tube. Um, I had, root canals, at least three. I broke this tooth here in the front on the bottom of the pool when I was diving. Um, I, was in, I was doing pseudo-competitive pseudo diving. Pseudo, I say pseudo-competitive diving in high school because we didn't actually have a coach. The coach was the swim coach, <coughs> and she would be down there busy with like, real athletes. And we would just throw ourselves off the diving board really nilly doing whatever we wanted. So, so one time free competition, one time during competition I did this move that's called reverse. It's when you, it's when you bounce off the diving board forward and then actually go backwards and enter the pool with your face facing the diving board. Pretty scary, but I was like, you know, 16 and I was doing gymnastics and so I just would just throw myself off the end of anything. Um, but for whatever reason during that time, I went into the water and I was, I was like nervous about the competition or I was kind of freaked out about something and I was, apparently I had this, I mean I did not see what my face looked like and there was no underwater camera but clearly because I broke the front of my tooth, 
I also had this grimace on my face when I went in. It was bare, with bare teeth. And, uh, and I didn't really pay t I didn't, usually you have to pull, you have to pull upwards before you hit the bottom of the pool. Um, but for whatever reason, I think I was nervous. I, I sort of came up towards the bottom at the very last minute, and my tooth, that I was just like nicked the bottom of the pool. Um, and it broke straight down the side. Um, amazingly, because I broke my tooth and didn't tear it out of my face, and or smash my face, and or break my neck, um, it is kind of a lucky thing. Like, it's my lucky tooth um, because of that. Because it's, it's lucky that I didn't do any of those other other things. But, um, but it did have to have a root canal, which I didn't get until years later when the sort of dead root, I'm going to get a little graphic here for you, dental code. Like the sort of dead root of the tooth, which had been dying slowly ever since that accident. Finally, it started to get like a little, I had a little like a, like an abscess underneath the top of my, under, I was like at the top of the root, but underneath my, kind of underneath my lip right about there. And this little abscess was kind of like, not so painful, but it was a little oozy. And eventually, the, 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 I said to the dentist, what is this thing up here? And he looked at it, he's like, oh, you got this little abscess here. Like, you know, like a, a little window shape. Like, got this little abscess here. Uh, we're going to have to get a root canal. Um, so I got that one done. Uh, I have, I think I had two back here, and then two, and at least two on the other. Well, one, well, okay. This is, a, this is a story that, um, this is a story that, that I wish I would have been able to tell the last report to him, but I, I was, I think he would have really loved this one. I told him a lot of dental stories, but, but there's been, you know, there's been updates since I last saw him. Uh, and this one is a real doozy. So this tooth, this tooth I got a root canal on, and, and it didn't take. And what that means is that for whatever reason, they just didn't clean the gunk out of the root enough, and so a little infection was growing there. So when you get a root canal, I don't know if any of you have had one, you know, they, they, they drill all down in there, they clean it all out, they fill it all full of stuff, and then they actually, they, well, they're good at the shave it all down, and they get rid of all the top part of the tooth and they shave it all down. More liquor. Um, so they shave it all down, and they clean out all the roots, and, um, and then they, then you have to get a crown made like a little porcelain thing that they kind of glue on top. Um, now this is a very expensive process. Um, at least, it's at least $800 for a crown, and then the root canal is something like 600. So I'm already really hurting. This is like a $1,200 tooth. So I get that done though, because like, I gotta get this done. There's nothing I can do about it. And then maybe about two years later, it starts to hurt, and I'm like, What's going on with this tooth? I, you know, I already spent like a fortune on it, and it's like, and it's starting to hurt. What am I going to have to get it pulled out? And I go to the dentist, and I say like, this tooth is starting to hurt. They take some X-rays. They say, oh, it looks like that root canal failed. It looks like you're probably, you're probably going to have to pull it out, and then you might actually um, have to get an implant. Uh, and I was like, oh man, an implant? Like this is like, this is like. You Transformers or something. I don't want to do that. It sounds like really, really horrible to have to, to, to do this whole like gruesome process of like, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have implants, but they take a titanium screw and they like, they take your tooth out and then they drill a hole into your jaw and then they basically like just screw this thing down into your jaw. And then they have this other little piece that they just screw on top, which is like a little, a little tooth pad. <laughs> and there. Um, and this process is totally grueling. It, it costs something like $2,500. Um, this is on a tooth that I had already spent about $1,300 on. But I mean, this, I'm like, I mean, can't, I was like, at this point, I was like, I just should just replace it with gold. You just take the whole thing out and just like stick a chunk of gold because this tooth is costing me like the down thing on my house. Um, but there was all this like kind of fear and kind of like, um, kind of 
craziness that the, the, de the, you know, the dentists make you anxious. So they put all this fear in me about, like, well, you got to get that implant because the whole shape of your jaw is going to change and, it, and you're young and you're going to chew and you can't just leave a hole there because everything will start falling into that hole. <laughs> you know, it's everything. I mean, everything will start falling into that hole. Uh, so I mean, really, like, I can't, I can't abide, I couldn't abide by that. You know, I was like, oh, Um, and so I was, you know, I was making okay money, consulting, freelancing, um, working for Airbird. Um, so I was like, okay, what the heck? You know, I made I made a few websites this week. I'll get myself an implant. Um, just go for it. It's Christmas. Just, just it's Christmas. Just go for it. Um, so I get this. I get this. Um, I get this process going for this implant. I get a really great recommendation from Megan McShay great implant doctor, um, Dr. Coletti, and uh, go out to Howard County Hospital, and, and I, and I, Be the last one. Um, and the last one, love these details because I would tell them I'm just like the most sort of like ecstatic and like excited and sort of like just like I was telling a story about like how when I was just like wailing I caught sight of the um, So I would tell it with a lot of anticipation. So, you know, I had a lot. I spent a lot of money into this, so it's almost like going to college and making your investment. So at least I had good stories to tell. Um, so, you know, I, when you take the cap off of this thing, this screw, you know, it's been sitting there for five years, and it's not airtight. So, you know, little bits of bacteria and stuff do tend to grow underneath the surface of this, underneath this little screw that they put in there to kind of hold it over. And, um, and suffice it to say that when you remove the cap, it is, it is actually pretty awful. Um, <laughs> Pretty awful. Just for like about three minutes, it's it's like it is like everything fell in there, and then everything came out. There is a there's a really potent bacterial decomposition spell, uh, which is kind of creepy. If you think, I mean, there's it's basically like having a corpse living in your tooth for five years, and then you took the cap off of it, and it like rises from the dead. Um, so anyway. So, but that, but it, it's fleeting, and apparently, apparently the, the Straumann, which is the implant that I have, is the least smelly of the implant. That's <laughs> what Dr. Bonnie said. She's like, ooh, that wasn't so bad. Usually it's worse. So I didn't feel like quite so embarrassed. Um, so typically, when I'm telling these stories to Blaster, there's always like this, there's always like this kind of climactic moment in the, in the sort of telling of my, my, uh, Tequila fuel in this case, dentist fuel. There's always there's always a really climactic moment um, when uh, when I, with something something to the effect of and then the dentist moved in with their Novocaine needle or and then the dentist took the pliers and moved in towards the tooth. Or, and then my mother tied a string around one end of my tooth and shut the door. And so inevitably, these stories, there would be this, this kind of tense and very, and very dramatic moment in my retelling. Um, and Blaster, who loved these stories, would be wrapped. You know, he'd have his, he, maybe he'd be on his second yank -like. Cocktail, um, blaster, abelia, all over the floor. Um, so there would be this inevitable moment when I, when I would sit down to my seat, stagger around aimlessly. Perhaps, perhaps I was I was high off the memories of impacted wisdom teeth, really cavities. <laughs> Root canals! <laughs> Percocet! 
so not so unused to someone in the throes of the dental story um, having a bit of a sort of epiphanic moment. Percocets! Root canals! Impacted wisdom teeth! Cavities! <laughs> so, this is my fondest memories of Blaster. Days spent sipping tequila, talking about my teeth. I think you, I think we all agree that Blaster was very talented at many things. He was a very good listener. He was a very good uh, person to inspire extraordinary moments uh, in one's recounting of dental stories. And uh, now good for this one is thrown. Blaster. Blaster used to say to me a lot, 
that uh, there's no such thing as shame anymore, but we still have embarrassment. <laughs> one of his crackpot theories, and um, uh, one of the more embarrassing and fascinating episodes in Blaster's life in Baltimore during this somewhat wild period of 92 through 98, let's say, when he first arrived, was that he carried on a very public romance with a young woman who was a, a graduate of the Maryland Institute who, do you remember her name, Rupert? The blonde girl? Very, very beautiful, very, very young looking woman who Blaster would make out with at the 14 Karat Cabaret, sometimes for hours, creating just an incredible spectacle, you know, like, I mean, really, really disruptive, crazy spectacle. I mean, whatever, I'm not moralizing about it one way or another, but, but it, was, it was really unusual and really strange, and there were a couple extra layers to it that just really stuck with me. One was that this woman had a, a boyfriend who was perhaps understandably upset about the, the public romance between his girlfriend and this six, probably 65-year-old, you know, kind of raggedy, you know, guy. And so Blaster had this overlay of, like, uh, paranoia in his life, because he always felt that the boyfriend was coming after him. This is just incredible to me. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe nobody else thinks this is funny. But, but if you knew Blaster, it was really odd that this worked this way. But the funniest part was that there were, Blaster got invited to a big mail art conf conference in Houston from a guy named John Held Jr., who's kind of like... In some ways, I mean, mail art has a lot of not very smart people involved in it, and John Hell Jr., Blaster, and John M. Bennett, and others are exceptions. Victoria Baroni, who was mentioned, is an exception. But, but John Hell Jr. is a very bland, bland, like white bread kind of guy, and he he like is a librarian in Texas who throws these huge mail art conferences, and it's very institutional and very not very interesting stuff. So Blaster and the young, probably literally like 18, 19 year old girlfriend, get on a bus and go to Texas. And when he arrives at the mail art conference, he tells all the people he meets, including John Hell, that she's a runaway that he met <laughs> on the train. It was the same mail art conference where he put, where, where Blaster uh, puckishly uh, uh, stuck a, a sign on this guy, this poor guy, John Hell, who was sort of his friend, um, his back. Um, when he was doing the, all the presentations in the Mailer conference, that he put a little sign on his back that said, I will work for heroin. And anyway, um, I, was, I, I, I really wish I had been a fly on the wall there, because I just could imagine that particular crowd trying to understand Blaster and this young woman that was traveling with him and all that stuff. I don't know why I tell that story. But anyway, um, I think this is going to be the last thing of the night, because frankly, I have two young children. Uh, but uh, we will now have Dan Breen and Lauren Petter. We would put a basket out at Normals and 
prospective employees would call up and say, I don't want to give Mr. Slee's a job. And he'd say, well, I'm so glad you called me today. Could you hold for a minute? I have to go to the toilet. I think my recommendation's over there. And I would go. But we need to pull these things out of the basket. Excuse me, in the fine uh, cavalier style, there will be a short moment for paper rustling and drink drinking. Excuse me. <laughs> Yates! <laughs> Number one. Yes, I'd be glad to give John Eaton a recommendation. He worked here three years and was a fine young man, an ideal employee. If it were possible for him to walk in here today in an opening suit of his qualifications, I'd remember little gauzy winged things fascinating him, and vice versa. He worked here three days, but I don't remember exactly when that was. Does anybody see these things? What are you doing on focus? Does anybody see any gauzy wing things? You got one there. Groovy. Alright, let's do that. There's a thing. Crap. A little crap. Alright, guy. Come here and focus. Hey. So. He worked here three, four days, but I don't remember exactly when it was. He had 18 bucks when he left here. You speak English quite, you speak English quite well, better than I do. Do you like American men? Now, if you excuse me, I have to dart around and make a hole in the sky. Two. Yes, I'd be glad to give John Eaton a recommendation. He worked here for 68 years. Do you like American men? I remember John Eaton. I remember the little look he had when he got to the, talking about his vast library of pornography. He said there was a sensation that penetrated those very vitals whenever he grappled at a tavern or a nightclub with another fellow pornographer in homage to his uh, Lord and Master, the Prince of Darkness, 28 years. Yeah, this is a good one. You're going to like this one. Yeah, good, 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 good one. Yeah, the club. Yeah, the club. Oh, yeah. The heat. The vitals, the heat. Yes, I'd be more than happy to give John Eaton a recommendation. He had a fine record. High scores on every sort of test. He had lupus. He had, he had two left feet. He used to keep us all in stitches of tails about exploring Louisiana with the South. Losing. I remember he had a thing about smoking cigarettes on a two. Now, if you excuse me, I remember it was John Eaton's pleasure to be on the Smithsonian mailing list and collect old ties. I mean, tires. <laughs> Number nine. Yes, John Eaton used to work here. He had a fine record. He used to keep us in stitches with his tales about meeting the Prince of Darkness at rodeos. Uh, you should have seen the way his mouth opened he talked about something too filthy to repeat here. <laughs> also, I sort of remember that it had to do with being able to master any task as he was opening a detective agency near the water cooler. You like American men? Some spiders? Judo? I got some, uh, some, some face, faces. <laughs> Number 10. Yes, 
Yes, I'd be happy to tell you about Johnny. You have made me so very lewd. He was never a regular employee, more like a person who felt sorry for it. Let come out and use the toilet. Thank you. Oh, God. Are you afraid of dying? Judo? Whoa. Oh. Ah, okay. Ah. I should give you the long end of this. You can pull it from where you're sitting. And you do it. Anyway. Yes, I'd be happy to tell you about Johnny. You made me so very lewd. He was never a regular employee, more like a person who felt sorry for when coming to use the toilet. He got morbid and stayed uh, awake for ten days at once. He worked here three years and saw godly wicked things in his honor. And I'd walk in here today and work three years. Now, excuse me, I tend to become a mountain owl. Oh, sure, I remember Johnny, and God, yes, only his real name was Estes Keefauber. He was with us several months last summer. He had 18 bucks when he left here. On his days off, he ch chased pussy like a maniac. <laughs> he was a master of judo, but he was strictly a victim of dark emotions. He had a fine record. He had lupus. He had a thing about smoking Carl Sandberg's feces on a toothpick. Yes, I'll be more than happy to sort a test, several commendations, become moody, uh, if you excuse me, have to go live on in print after the oral necessities. And there's one last thing. I only have these two little arms here, like, like you are some kind of Tyrannosaurus Rex or Allosaurus. Some kind of useless bowling dinosaur if you went bowling with all your dinosaur friends and no one had any good arms to win you and you have to keep score all the time and you're sitting there. He's like, yeah, I'll go get you guys some more pizza and some more beer. I don't care. The thing here is really, I can tell you about it later after the show if I don't wind up finding it here in planet Earth in real time. But it was a, a really delightful project to uh, illustrate my own death and recommendation from Brother John Eaton. You know, he's a nice man. Hey, I found some more pieces. Oh, this is a good one. You guys liked that one before. Maybe not that again. Oh, that's a way of things. Hey, good luck. saying it for probably 15 years 
and uh, I'll leave you with this tonight. And alas, how always knows no principle except to supply as a duty what heart was deficient in. Thank you very much.